And it's a great pleasure for me to be presenting this um, with uh, a wonderful scholar and act activist. And uh, please, quiet. As, as you have, of course, uh, had a chance to hear Mary speak throughout the week uh, about the role of women at different times, she has um, emphasized the importance of the role of women in all of the different movements and campaigns that we have <coughs> talked about. We, we thought that it would be important to have a um, historical overview of many of these campaigns seen through the lens of uh, women's action. Uh, I'm, my name is Anne-Marie I think I, I've met most of you at this point. I hope uh, uh, I have had a chance to talk to you all. Uh, I have been um, an academic advisor with ICNC for a um, few years and um, particularly interested in that, in that topic of research. So uh, by way of introduction, um, uh, it's important to realize that um, uh, most of the historians um, throughout uh, uh, you know, centuries have not really paid attention and, and given credit to um, women's actions. That's, that's the reason why uh, um, women's story has not been covered uh, properly and because women have mostly uh, engaged in uh, the issues of their time, the, the political issues through nonviolent means, as a result, uh, uh, there, there was a, 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 a misrepresentation in historical books about um, uh, about uh, the different nonviolent campaigns throughout history that have been waged mostly by women, and this is what we would like to to cover uh, mostly in this presentation. So I'm just going to say, by way of background, a couple of points that you should bear in, in the back of your mind. One is that we often forget that human rights laws and conventions are not just something written by lawmakers in a suspended process. Many, many, many human rights that we now regard as universal had first to be fought for by mass nonviolent movements, and only then were they codified. This is often overlooked, and it is not taught in law schools including the University for Peace program. Did anybody ever mention to you where the human rights laws came from? I study from law lawyers, lawyers, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's a problem. Very um, <laughs> So it was human rights movements, civil rights movements, minority movements, women's movements, and so on that resulted in the institutionalization of, of laws often. I want to remind everyone that we are not talking about conflict resolution. Conflict resolution may be one outcome of a civil resistance movement, but not necessarily. Civil resistance is predicated on the assumption that there will always be conflict, and the question is how to manage it until it breaks out again. And the last thing to remember is that most of the gendered injustices that Diane was talking about with us earlier in the week are enshrined in legal systems. They're perfectly legal. So this is just by way of background. I'm sorry, can I ask a question on what you just said? Or should I'll ask you later. What our plan would actually be, because we're, we're going from antiquity <laughs> into the contemporary area. Uh, you're right. It's all right with you. Question. We'd like to go through the PowerPoint and then get to the questions, because I don't think at any other moment in FSI have we covered such a sweep of history. Okay. So hold on to it a little bit. We actually don't have the full chronology. We're not starting with <laughs> no, <it's> antiquity, <laughs> but it's uh, not century by century. So we wanted to start with this quote uh, by Pam uh, McAllister, who is a scholar in gender studies, and who said that most of what we commonly call women's history is actually the history of women's role in the development of nonviolent action. Women have, um, throughout um, history, have, have uh, engaged in, in political action, social actions, uh, and have been agents of social change, and they have used nonviolent uh, techniques um, throughout uh, history. We are going to start with this um, uh, 
the campaign, this century-long campaign and, and struggle uh, against slavery, which started in England um, in the late uh, 18th century. Uh, this is uh, the seal of the British Anti-Slavery Society, Am I Not a Man and a Brother? And women, uh, at a time when they were absolutely not part of the public discourse, they didn't have a space uh, uh, in the public um, uh, in, in the access of the public space, they are going to engage uh, massively in this campaign um, for the abolition of slavery on both sides of the Atlantic and here in, uh, uh, in America. Um, uh, we see that uh, through that campaign, women, both white and black women, are going to come together and form coalition and work together um, in critical roles of leadership. Um, here, for instance, Maria Stewart, Harriet uh, Tubman, so John of Truth were uh, well-known um, black women activists, and um, the, the Brinker sisters and Lucy Stone, Lucy Stone, um, a famous abolitionist and also an advocate of women's rights, um, who uh, said, I expect to plead not, on, not for the slave only, but for suffering humanity everywhere. Especially do I mean to labor for the elevation of my sex. Indeed, it's through this struggle for the rights of uh, oppressed people that women uh, got empowered to uh, claim equal, equal rights for themselves as women. Um, and through, uh, through that, uh, the struggle um, uh, uh, for the abolition of slavery, uh, we see the emergence of um, the women's rights movement. Here uh, is a, a, a lithography of uh, the National Women's Suffrage Association in Chicago in 1880. And the all suffragist movement uh, uh, grew uh, uh, at the end of the, of the 19th century uh, and both uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, Suffragette is a term that is more particularly associated uh, with the action of women in, in England. Uh, and um, I, wanna, I wanted to point out that in England they, they were uh, really Im imprisoned and uh, a lot of them had uh, went to hunger strike. Uh, it was a very, um, it's, it's a very um, uh, it's important it's struggle. Bridge. Suffrage is a right to vote, uh, so the right to vote, and they were forced fed in prison. I and mean, this was a very uh, harsh struggle uh, that women went through in the, in the late uh, uh, 19th century and early 20th century. For instance, we see here um, rallies of women for the vote of women in 1930. So this, this, this was a transnational movement for, for the, the right of women to vote that actually um, has been described by uh, Fred Halliday as uh, one of the most remarkable transnational movements of the modern age. Um, the first country that uh, um, voted, uh, that uh, accepted uh, the, the franchise women to vote was New Zealand in 1893. Many of the countries followed in the early 20th century and you see that um, movements were formed already all over the world, even way before uh, European countries uh, had accepted um, to uh, enshrine it in the law. And actually in New Zealand, it took several decades to achieve. This is um, Japan in 1946, when women voted for the first time. And part of the, or part of the way that that happened is that Japan was then under the United States occupation. And the United States gave the final oomph to the Japanese government to get women the vote. And it didn't occur until 1946. Yes. Coincidentally, an American woman had already got that right. How many years previously? Say your question again. How many years previously had an American woman gotten that right? It's 1918 is when Americans... 19, 19, 19. 19. 
1919 and 1920. Yeah. And several European countries were, it was after World War II. Yeah. France yeah. in 1945. The Swiss women only got it a few years ago. Yeah. So in, a, in the case of, of independent struggles, women were uh, at the front line. Uh, for instance, uh, in, in India, uh, we know that um, even if Gandhi was often criticized for uh, not paying attention uh, enough to women's rights, he actually um, emphasized the role uh, of women in the struggle. Here we see uh, women in the salt march, and um, in the whole constructive program that uh, Gandhi was um, advocating as a way for the Indian society to um, to get back its uh, uh, its self-sufficiency and its, uh, to be able to manage itself without having to uh, rely at all on, on the British, uh, it was important to get back to um, the local production of uh, textile. And, and here, of course, millions of women were part of that movement of uh, autonomization of, of the economy of, of India. Uh, as a result of their, of their role in all of these uh, struggles for uh, independence, when the post-colonial countries got their independence uh, after World War II um, and in the 1960s, uh, their role was recognized. The concept of women as voters became assumed uh, as um, uh, an obvious uh, outcome from their role in the, in the struggles. Another uh, story, just, just for a second. Yes. And the idea of women voting had become part of the concept of the modern nation state, so it was easier to fight if they had to fight. But in many instances, they didn't have to. Yes, they did have to fight that struggle. They, yeah. they were also struggles, of course, that they to continue to fight for. Um, another uh, struggle starting in the 19th century through which women uh, gained much more, um, got more empowered is through the workers' struggles, the labor unions. Um, many women unionists played uh, critical roles. Here we see um, in France, uh, Louise Michel was an anarchist, but also uh, was a very important figure in the workers' movements uh, in France. In the United States, uh, Lucy Parsons, uh, the famous U.S. labor organizer, uh, was critical in the uh, formation of the first uh, women's trade union league. And Maud Malone uh, was a spokeswoman for library employees in, in New York City, uh, fought uh, one of the first um, struggle for um, equal uh, pay, or actually for fact, against the inferior status of women workers. So through all these uh, different struggles, women also um, started claiming their right as equals to men. I mentioned this earlier in FSI, that most women's action historically has actually been civil resistance. Uh, another term that you need to have familiarity with is the term nonviolent direct action. And this is extremely important to understand, and that is that nonviolent direct action means going directly to the source of the grievance. So you're not working through an agency or through a parliamentary representative or through some other representative channel. You are going right to the source of the problem or the predicament and organizing your action there. Be familiar with this term. It's not exactly the same as civil resistance, which is a larger terminology that refers to the entire technique, part of which is nonviolent direct action. And most women's activism over the centuries has in fact been nonviolent direct action. They weren't in the parliaments. They didn't have people who cared to represent them. Or those who were in parliaments felt that it was not important to represent them. So they have historically always gone to the heart of the problem. And this has actually been very instrumental for the development of the technique. You go, Bill. The Montgomery Bus Boycott, 1955 to 1956. Now, we see here a picture of Rosa Parks with the striped shirt. 
And who do you see behind her? Okay. This photograph is actually an accurate representation. This is the way all of the storytelling about the Montgomery Bus boycott should be told in this way. It was the Women's Political Caucus in the black community in Montgomery that actually had the idea for a citywide action against the discrimination in the bus system and had been working on it for three years prior to 1955. Rosa Parks got arrested on December 1st, 1955. She was a person so respected in that community that once she was in jail, all sorts of activity was unleashed in the black community. She was the secretary of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, which was formed approximately when A and C was formed in that period, 1910, something like that. And she had been preparing the children of Montgomery who were going to integrate the school. She'd been making sure that they had clothes. She was a seamstress. She had been making clothes, making sure that they not only had shoes, but that they had socks. And so everybody respected her. Um, and it, once she was in jail, the head of the NAACP began to go to work on organizing the entire community. Now, it's taught to American school children that she had tired feet, and this is absolute nonsense. She understood that in the buses of those days, a black person had to get on at the front of the bus, pay their money, and then step down off the bus, walk to the rear entrance of the bus, and get back on again. In the middle were seats. The front seats were for white people, and then behind there were other seats, which a black person could sit in until somebody white got on the bus, and then they would have to rise and yield the seat. Rosa Parks actually waited for several full buses to pass until she found one that was empty. And she got on because she wanted to sit in that middle seat and not be asked to move. And she thought she would get to ride home without being asked to move. Well, the previous summer, she had attended a late <coughs> organizing event in Monteagle, Tennessee, the Folklander, High, uh, Highlander Folk Center. It was the first time she had ever met white people who were concerned about social justice for black people. But she also learned all of the basics of nonviolent action, including how you can be a participant in civil disobedience and intentionally break the law. So finally, the driver came to her. He got off the bus, he went to get the police. She had six chances where she could have left that bus if she wanted to. She knew precisely what she was doing. Finally, the bus driver said to her, we're going to have to have you arrested. And she said to him, you may do that. So this, this was an act of very highly informed political awareness and knowledge of civil resistance. In fact, many of the uh, civil rights uh, most important figures were women although they have been overlooked in the writing of history. This is Sojourner Truth in the upper left, who was a leader uh, for the emancipation of slaves. Ida Wells, who participated in direct action very early. Ella Baker is on the left, second down. I'm going to mention her later on. Ella Baker was in a comparable position to SNCC as was Jim Lawson, and she also advised the, student, the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Ella Baker had been a field secretary for the NAACP, the National Association of Colored People, traveling alone in the 1940s in Mississippi to organize branches. She's one of the most significant people in the history of civil rights in the United States, and it's from her that SNCC's philosophy of identifying talented people with potential for leadership and then preparing them 
to assume leadership came from. It was her emphasis. And then Pauli Murray was another important figure. Septima Clark down here on the lower left. Septima Clark is sitting with Rosa Parks. Septima Clark was part of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and RAD training programs. And then over here is Joanne Robinson. And Joanne Robinson is actually the heroine of the Montgomery Bus Boycott. Once Rosa Parks was in prison, Joanne Robinson, having been part of that political caucus, prepared flyers and went to work and overnight mimeographed 37,000 copies of those flyers. What was a mimeograph? A mimeograph was an early form of reproduction. You had to type a stencil and put it on a drum and push it around for each flyer that was printed. And for a week afterwards, your hands would stink. And that's what Joanne Robinson did. And she got those flyers out to all of the schools by Friday morning. Because in order for it to be announced in church on Sunday, that there was to be a boycott, it had to reach the school children going home on Friday. Rosa Parks was arrested on Thursday night. So Joanne Robinson, there's often a woman or a group of women who are unheralded, who are not part of the historiography, who are actually part of the genesis of a nonviolent movement, whose dimension in the film, it's uh, middle-aged women that spark the Port Elizabeth boycott. And Jim mentioned the women, the middle-aged women in, in Nashville. This is a quote from Septima Clark. She's the one I told you about who's running training programs. In stories about the civil rights movement, you hear mostly about the black ministers. But if you talk to the women who were there, you will hear another story. I think that the civil rights movement would never have taken off if some women hadn't started to speak up. And a quote from Ella Baker. The movement of the 1950s and 1960s was carried largely by women since it came out of church groups. Their number in the movement was much larger than that of men. And, and let me say something here because uh, Mireille, the other day you said women are mostly the participants of nonviolent movements. And then on Wednesday night, Luke, you said men are mostly the participants in nonviolent movements. And let me just share with you that we actually don't have the research to make either assertion, and they may both be wrong. Um, so be cautious about saying it's mostly women or it's mostly men. In certain, in certain campaigns like this one, we, uh, as we can see on the picture in the First Baptist Church, it was mostly women because also they were the, the ones who were getting on the buses so the, 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 to go to work. So in that particular campaign, it was definitely the women that were most crucial. And, and actually, Martin Luther King has to be dragooned into leadership. Dragooned. He has to be forced into leadership. He had not come to Montgomery to be a political leader. He had come to be a minister of the gospel. But Mr. E.D. Nixon, who went to work once Rosa Parks was in jail, called a list of 21 ministers and said, will you come to a meeting tonight? And the first minister was not at home, so he went on down the list of 21. And when he got to the end, he went back to the top lip part of the person on the list. Will you come to the meeting tonight? And that minister said, well, I don't know. I heard this from Mr. E.D. Nixon himself. Well, I don't know. And Mr. Nixon said, well, you better be there, because I done told all the other ministers it was going to be at your church. And it was at Martin Luther King's church, and then Mr. Nixon proceeded to pummel him until Martin Luther King was willing to take the leadership of the boycott organization. <laughs> the women, not only are the women behind it, but King had to be almost forced into the leadership. But it's another uh, famous uh, historical case where uh, the role of women has not been reported um, uh, Accurately. So in the, in the struggle against communism in, in uh, 1918-51, actually, in the formation of Solidarność, uh, the, uh, the union, uh, half of the members were women. Women uh, started uh, major demonstrations 
um, against food for shortages um, called uh, the Women's Hunger March in, in August 1981. And um, in the in the communist societies, uh, there was uh, at least um, theoretically much more equality between men and women. Um, but uh, regardless, the role of women has not been uh, sufficiently um, uh, covered and there is this recent uh, book that has been uh, published by Shana Penn, um, Solidarity Secret, the women who defeated communism in Poland, who uh, emphasizes the fact that when the martial law uh, in, on December uh, 1981 was imposed, and when most of the, the male leaders of Solidarity were rounded up and arrested, uh, Solidarność went completely underground, and it is the women who run the, the organization uh, for the um, uh, following months uh, and years, and kept um, uh, the organization running. They hid all the the, the, the male leaders, uh, were, uh, and, they, and, they, and they continued the, the, the Solidarity newspaper. Um, and this, 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 this story, this other side of the story of Solidarność is still not very well known, including in Poland. Now let's come back to a, a current movement that is still underway. Um, if you look at uh, the movement of uh, the women for their rights in Iran, um, it has been uh, said by um, uh, Shirin Ebadi, with the uh, uh, Human Rights Defenders and the Civil Rights Party in 2003, that it w the, the victory for women, for women's rights, would pave the way for democracy in Iran. And indeed, we can see that uh, the first major campaign that started in, in 2006 was a campaign launched to um, reform uh, some of the basic injustice in uh, the marriage law. Uh, in divorce, uh, uh, in the fact that women could not inherit, and those, this this uh, legal campaign to change, to make those changes in the law, was carried by this one million signatures campaign, uh, where women would go door to door, organize to get signatures, and they made this campaign into an international campaign, um, where uh, hundreds of thousands of signatures were also collected uh, outside of Iran. Uh, this campaign was not successful, but it um, has been credited to have really uh, ignited uh, the, the movement that uh, eventually um, became uh, the, the, the green wave of 2009. So what they were using uh, was a lot of tactical innovations, non cooperation, symbols, songs, and they started using a lot of um, digital media. Uh, and actually, Iran is one of the countries where um, the, the number of, uh, of bloggers uh, is one of the um, most important per capita in the world. Um, so the first of the of these tactics that they, they use uh, here, dilemma action, is that, for instance, you um, do an action where you put your opponent in a situation where whether they um, strike back at you or, or, or whether they don't do anything, they are going to lose. They are going to lose space. Uh, they, so for instance, if you have a woman who comes into a stadium for um, a, a sport event, which was uh, forbidden, uh, then you either have to forcefully take her in, in the view of thousands of people or not. And you put really the authorities into a dilemma. So, so as I said, this uh, um, movement for women's rights was uh, crucial in um, um, bringing, uh, in 2009, during the, the election campaign, the, the Green Wave uh, of 2009. Um, another point that I would like to mention, and that is uh, oftentimes uh, not uh, looked at, is there are much more long-term changes uh, sometimes in societies where women, um, by um, by uh, changing uh, drastically their um, um, uh, reproduction, uh, their their. their um, uh, by having more, more uh, empowered, uh, being more empowered on their reproduction decisions, uh, it, it, they really um, change 
they change the society uh, um, in, a, in, a, in a very significant way. So in Iran is a very interesting case where you see the, the fastest transition, the fertility transition of uh, all the countries uh, in the world. So in, in the early 1980s, um, on average, uh, women had seven children, um, which is a very, very high fertility rate. And you see that in by, by 2009, uh, the, the, that rate had dropped to 1.8 children, which is below the replacement level for generation. Very important uh, figure for demographers. And actually, all the demographers of the world were astonished to see that figure. They could not believe it. And this probably uh, means that, uh, in fact, the, uh, in Iran, there is, um, uh, there is really a shift in gender uh, dynamics that women uh, um, are much more empowered than, than what is um, sought. Uh, what happened is that uh, uh, education and health are really two very important factors that explain why um, you, know, you have such a, a, a drop in fertility. Women are very educated. Their uh, education is uh, totally, um, they have 100% uh, access to education, so there is no illiteracy in Iran for we, uh, among women. And they also have access to uh, health care where they have been able to, um, uh, uh, to be in contact with women workers and, and health, uh, health service workers that have really given them you know, uh, all the tools for their contraception. Uh, and this is what explains in the case of Iran, contrary to all of the other Muslim countries, why women uh, have been able to um, get take complete control over their fertility in such a short period of time. So um, I could just quickly add to it, it's interesting that especially younger women in Iran are also much better educated than younger men because there's so much pressure on young men to make money so that they're able to afford brides, uh, that they vastly outperform <coughs> young men. And um, when I was there, one of the most memorable lines that I heard from a man was, it is the women who will bring down the monarchs. Absolutely. And uh, we should change the PowerPoint. It's the women who will bring down the mullahs. Women that will bring down the mullahs. And that was also in the in the labor force. They are already 45% um, of the labor force, which is a very high figure um, in Muslim countries. And uh, I wanted to quote that from that. I mean, that film that uh, got the Oscar Best Foreign Film in 2012 uh, shows the, the the history of family and the divorce. And you can tell, and a, a, a film can be a very, um, can, can be very tell, telling on the evolution of society because you see that uh, at, the, uh, at the level of a couple, uh, there's much more of a balance of power. And there are two different couples in this uh, film that are featured, one from the middle class and one from the uh, working class that is much more uh, conservative. But even in that couple, you see the dynam a very interesting dynamic happening. So the question is, uh, is it the okay case that patriarchy is losing uh, ground uh, in Iran, besides the fact that this is a Islamic society? So we want to look at uh, precisely these very patriarchal uh, systems where Despite all the constraints that women have in those uh, patriarchal systems, they have been able to um, to be very creative uh, in, 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 in waging um, their struggles. What's, what happened in the in the system of extreme patriarchy is that uh, the, uh, the, the, there is a polarization, a very poor polarization between the ideal of a woman and the ideal of a man. Uh, so you have. Subjugation of the woman is considered as second class citizen, a minor. She's too weak and too ignorant to make her own decisions. And she needs to be protected uh, and cared for by a man, whether a father, a husband, a brother. At the same time, you have an idealization of a woman as uh, the good wife or the, and the good mother. So this is the space that she has in society as a nurturer, protector, and an educator of the children. And in that context, there is, as I said, the polarization, exaggeration of stereotypes between the men as seen as hyper males and, and the celebration of, of, of military values on the one hand and the celebration of the quote-unquote um, uh, women's values, traditional values. 
because of those societies are founded on those cultural pillars of support, women can use those um, those constraints as actually space to create dilemma actions. If they challenge these authorities in the name of these superior values as mothers and as, as good wives and as good mothers, then they are going to create a dilemma action for the authorities. And this is what we're going to see historically has happened in many cases. So in Berlin in 1943, uh, Jim mentioned this earlier in the week, there were women who were married to Jewish men. There were, there were Gentile women who were married to Jewish men. And the Jewish men had been rounded up to be taken to death camps. The Gentile women who were their wives began to demonstrate for one week, literally in front of the Gestapo. And this posed an extraordinary dilemma for the Nazi authorities and eventually they released the 1,700 men who had been married to those women. There is now a book on it. Nathan Stoltzfus has written a book about it, and um, there's a chapter in one of the books that you, uh, The Waging Nonviolent Struggle, has a chapter by Nathan Stoltzfus, so we've already got this. And there's also a movie, There's also a movie. There's a film also, yes. Uh, I think that Argentina, in, from 1976 to 1983, as we mentioned, this was a severe dictatorship, military dictatorship run by generals, <clears throat> since been called the Dirty War. And many people have been disappeared. The figures vary, but an Argentine general has recently died who admitted to a reporter that at least 6,000 have been disappeared. Most historians and social scientists who've studied this think that it's closer to 30,000, mostly young people, flown out over the sea and dropped from helicopters into the sea or buried in mass burial sites, a time of fear for everyone. And then weekly, the mothers of some of the disappeared began to appear marching before Plaza de Mayo which has a long history in Argentine history as a political uh, symbol in the society. And every week they would appear wearing a kerchief. On the back of the kerchief would be a photograph um, imprinted on the kerchief of their child who had been disappeared. And uh, their goal was a very modest goal. My students are always perplexed about this. All they wanted was acknowledgement of what had happened to their children. My students get upset. Didn't they want reparations? Very agitated. No, all the mothers wanted was knowledge. But this was perhaps all that they could ask for in that context, where anyone could be disappeared at any time. And in fact, some of the mothers themselves were disappeared. Chile's mothers resisting in the 1980s used a different approach. Traditional tapestries, arpilleros. Alice, have I pronounced it properly? Uh, yeah, the L sounds like a Y. Um, nobody paid attention to the women as they sewed these tapestries, but in fact they were bearing stories and information. They could be smuggled into prisons and told what was going on, what was the mobilization underway outside in the democracy movement. They also went around the world and helped to arouse third-party solidarity movements and support of the Chilean democracy movement. You had a question. Mm -hmm. No, I just had a comment related to the mothers of the Plaza de Maya, which mm -hmm. were the kerchiefs with the photo on the back. So something I've seen in Mexico where disappearance is a current issue. Um, is a lot of the movements are led by women, but I've recently seen men wearing handkerchiefs and the photos over the mouth, the photos of a disappeared person. And I hadn't made that connection with the Plaza de Mayo focus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the presence of women can lower the level of violent responses from security forces. 
This is nothing that's guaranteed. We are speaking observationally here. We're not speaking prescriptively. But it has been observed historically that the presence of women can have an effect of reducing the violent response of security forces. Beating of women can sometimes, not in Jenny's case, not in Jenny's case, sometimes in life, but sometimes, sometimes uh, the beating of women poses stronger moral uh, predicaments. Um, women on the front line in direct contact with police and security forces can also sometimes ameliorate the violence needed out to men. And here's a picture from Versailles in the 18th century with the women in front. We used to do that in the Civil Rights Movement. We put the, the mother of Governor Peabody of Massachusetts, who was about four feet high and had a top knot, we put her in the front of the demonstrations in St. Augustine and so on. Here are women in Serbia and uh, in Cairo. I just wanted to say a word about uh, the, the French Revolution. This is one of the most important days of the Revolution, not so, so well known maybe here. It is when the, the women from Paris went to Versailles to ask the king for bread, because they, and um, the, the troop did not shoot at the women. So they, the, the king will talk to them, and then they were able to bring him back to Paris, which was a very important political act, because then he was a really prisoner of the people of Paris. He was not in Versailles anymore. So just to... Uh, to Sorry, they history. just wanted bread. They went to ask the king for bread. Bread, yes, but then the king you know, didn't have an answer for them, and then he went with them back to Paris, because they wanted to show him how the people of Paris was suffering, but he was too far in that side. Another very simple request, right? Yeah. So here on the left, you have a picture worth a thousand words. <laughs> this woman kissing the soldier and calling him, my son, you remind me of your son, my son. Um, women can have a disarming effect in a photograph from the Ukraine Orange Revolution in which the nonviolent frater method of fraternization was used very systematically. They began working early. Also, in the struggle of Georgia on the Black Sea, the Rose Revolution, they began work using fraternization very early in the process. Now, with regard, we said we were going to go back into antiquity. Um, the, there had been constant warfare between Athens and Sparta. And a play was written by Aristophanes, one of the ancient Greek playwrights, which was a comic spoof. He called it Lysistrata. Lysistrata was the heroine of the play. And Lysistrata went amongst the war-weary women of Athens and said, well, why don't we withhold intimacy from our men? And this has come down to us today. This is actually in Jean Sharp's 198 Methods, the Lysistratic non-action. But scholars believe it's happened earlier than in ancient Greece, that it goes way back, and it has been much more pervasively used than anyone has been able to document. We do know it was used in Colombia in 1997 and 2006. In Liberia in 2003 and Kenya in 2009. We're going to talk about that briefly as we move to Africa. Um, first, here's a picture of Wangari Maathai, who won a Nobel Prize, Peace Prize, in, in 2004. Uh, she was repeatedly arrested and beaten, and for 30 years mobilized 50,000 poor women to plant 40 million trees. This was for protection of the environment because of the devastating effect of corporations that were cutting down trees. But also hers was an anti-corruption movement. And she was mobilizing those women to clean up Kenyan politics. Very badly treated, but eventually recognized by the outside world. Now right here in this room, in Schmidheimie, two years ago, uh, when I showed this photograph, one of the FSIers came up to me afterwards and said, this is a picture of mothers of political prisoners. This is an organization that my mother was a member of while I was a political prisoner. And here, Wangari Matai is meeting with my mother's group, and she helped to start the group. So it has the 
a little connection for you. Liberty Corner is where she was meeting with them. In Liberia, I think everybody has heard about Lema Gawoi and President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who, both of whom were among three women who won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2011. And they, they threatened Lysistratic non-action, um, and many of them actually used it to bring about the talks that would eventually end 14 years of civil war. I'm teaching now in a program, a joint degree between the University for Peace and the University of Dakar, Senegal. And my co-professor, who has two PhDs in the Vietnam War, incidentally, has told me that indisputably, Lema Gavoy's group played a significant role in ending 14 years of civil war. It's just not properly literature yet. If you have never uh, seen this film, I really recommend it. Uh, so it's the whole uh, struggle of uh, the women of uh, Liberia. And you see how it's called Train the Devil Back to Hell. Um, do you think we have like maybe two minutes? I can show you the trailer. Maybe after in the discussion, if we have time, I'll show you the trailer. But um, it's, um, it's a very, uh, uh, very compelling documentary. Somebody asked a question about my area to give us an excuse to show you the two minute trailer. <laughs> now we're on to another group um, uh, that you know a good deal about. And um, um, Sorry, I just wanted to say before you go to Warsaw. Um, Lema also what was crucial in the struggle of, of, of Lema is that they united Muslim and Christian women. Mm -hmm. And that's no very else significant. Yeah. Which no one else has been able to do. Yeah. So it's important for you to see the video. Yeah. Right. Here you see Anne Marie gave four long stem roses to the Lawson Award winners on Wednesday. And here you see one of the Woza posters. <laughs> so uh, we want to get to your question, so we'll move on to the Middle East. Uh, the Palestinian women were well ahead of their time and their region. At a time when women elsewhere were fighting uh, for uh, very, very basic rights, politically, the Palestinian women were way ahead and were fighting for self-rule. Uh, in 1921, the Palestinian Women's Union was created. In 1929, there was a Congress of Women, the first Arab Women's Congress of Palestine with women from across the Arab world. And they wrote telegrams to Queen Mary, to the British government, the League of Nations. What they said can be boiled down to one sentence. What they said was, fulfill your promises. They're addressing the British. Fulfill your promises to the Arabs as you have fulfilled your promises to the Jews. That was their mantra. That was their message. And one of the most extraordinary things is a silent demonstration of Christian and Muslim women. Again, and we'll see women are often able to play this unifying role, Jenny, in a way that has been impossible for any of the men involved. Uh, silent demonstration of Christian and Muslim women in the old city of Jerusalem in which they started at a mosque in which a Christian woman spoke and then walked through the rain in April 1933 until they got to a church and there a Muslim woman spoke. That alone is extraordinary. If you talk to a knowledgeable historian about this conflict, that alone of a Christian woman speaking in a mosque and a Muslim woman speaking in a church is remarkable. And here you see a photograph of a delegation I found in Oxford, and I believe I'm the first person ever to write about it. It's mentioned in my book, Quiet Revolution. You see the women are veiled. A delegation of women went to see the British High Commissioner in 1929, and when they sat down with him, they threw off their veils, which meant they were there to discuss something about which they were very seriously upset. They were go going past the social decorum. Mm -hmm. When I found the record in the archive, as he's writing a report to London, when he starts writing about this moment when they throw back their veils, his handwriting starts shaking, he's crossing out the lines, he was obviously affected by it. Mm -hmm. 
So here they are. Um, this is the, 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 the second woman from the left, Mateo Mogana, has written a book called The Arab Woman and the Palestine Problem in 1937, which is exquisitely written history of the time. With regard to the fight for Palestine and women's rights, they often went hand in hand. This is a quote from Zahira Kamal, who is the first elected female leader of the political party in Palestine in 2011. And she said, personal and national liberation go hand in hand. When both sexes are deprived of their freedom and national dignity by the Israelis, it would be inappropriate for us to deal only with sexual inequalities. On the other hand, we will fail both women and our cause if we do not understand the liberating women from discrimination will better equip them for waging national struggle. Uh, here is a poster from the General Union of Palestinian Women. And I want you to take a close look at the photograph. This is a demonstration in Bethlehem in the 1987 Intifada, the first Intifada. You see they put the old women at the front of the demonstration, they're wearing a traditional hand embroidered garb. And there were more than 100 women alone demonstrations in the first year of the 1987 Intifada. Very high level of women's activity. And it was women who would immediately step in to run and lead the popular committees that emerged to help communities fight very harsh reprisals that were rained on them, including 23-hour curfews, 24-hour curfews. I want to mention a chapter in Mary's book about women at the forefront of non-violent strategies during the first intifada. Mm -hmm. So if we actually compare the two intifadas, um, and this is a table that is in Erika and Maria's book, um, you see that in the first intifada, uh, which was mostly non-violent campaign, you had uh, groups of uh, students, intellectuals, uh, for rural businesses, and women's groups were very prominent here. Um, whereas the second intifada, uh, you, you almost, uh, the, the women have almost disappeared completely from uh, the space, and it's much more extremist groups um, that, um, that will be uh, the second intifada. So what happened, and this has been uh, interpreted that in the years where the Palestinian Authority came into power in the 1990s, uh, they basically told the women, thank you very much, you have done your work uh, here, but we don't really need you, go home. So the, the women have been really uh, marginalized uh, um, from 1993 on, and um, as a result, uh, they were absolutely not present in uh, when the, the second uh, intifada uh, broke out. And, and, and during the, that decade, uh, there was an um, Islamization of the Palestinian society that also uh, happened. So what we see now in that third phase of the Palestinian uh, continuing struggle is that uh, it's only at the level of um, local villages, uh, local campaigns, for instance, uh, the Boudrous, Berlin, uh, and other villages that are rising uh, against the wall of separation, that women have been able to uh, regain a space of uh, engagement. Uh, this film, uh, this documentary, Boudrous, um, uh, it show, shows actually the, the one-year struggle of that village, where young women were uh, part of, the, of that campaign. Uh, uh, and there's again a trailer that I would like maybe to show you later, if we have time, but that really shows how critical they have been, because they were, the, the, the young men were not able at all to, uh, if, they were, if they were in front, uh, um, in front line, the Israeli soldiers would, would shoot at them, whereas the young women were able to come in from much stronger, and and then the the violence response was much much lesser with the young women, and they were able to stop the bulldozer from taking out there, from uh, putting their olive trees. They would they would stay in uh, right in front of the bulldozer and, and protect their. Literally, physically, they would protect their trees, their olive trees. Mm -hmm. 
no, no. We, we um, also on the on the side of the Israeli society, there were also many groups of women that, from the first intifada, from the time of the first intifada on, have um, organized uh, to uh, to denunciate all the uh, uh, human rights abuse in the Palestinian authorities and the Palestinian territories. Sorry, and one of the most famous is the Women in Black which started in 1988, now has 150 chapters all around the world. And they just, st uh, uh, they, they dress in black in the um, color of mourning and uh, with signs of um, uh, and with the, and the occupation and they are in major squares uh, and also they, um, they stay at checkpoints to uh, monitor all the um, human rights abuse that may happen in checkpoints. And we can say more about that. Another movement uh, uh, in Israel that um, was named after uh, four mothers uh, whose uh, sons had served uh, in um, the Israeli army, the IDF, in Lebanon, uh, and who wanted to um, start a movement to uh, bring the troops back. Uh, uh, so they started petitions and vigils uh, and um, drawn thousands, tens of thousands of supporters, and this movement was uh, very, um, very important in, in uh, one of the most successful grassroots organizations in Israel uh, in the late uh, 1990s. Well, the, the, it is attributed to them the success of the yeah. withdrawal of the IDF from Lebanon in 1982. Somehow, we actually shortened this PowerPoint, and that crucial point got lost. <laughs> and they are regarded as extremely effective as a prototype. And on women in black, women in black played an important role with uh, Serbia. Uh, the women in black, black group were part of the transmission of knowledge, the documents coming in to Serbia in the years prior to the Austin and Milosevic. So we'll go on to the Arab awakening. Um, with regard to the formation of democracies. One of the women in black, Lydia. Her mom was Serbian Israeli, and she was carrying materials back and forth all the time, and they like brought yeah, it was so sorry. Yeah, yeah, and probably was able to do it with less interruption. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 able to do. So, in talking about uh, Syria this morning and the Arab awakening, um, the the. The most uh, decisive thing that had to happen early in the Arab awakenings was to break the patriarchal succession, the passage of power from father to son. If you couldn't get rid of that, you couldn't begin to work on democracy. The presumption of father-son transmission of rule stood in the way of any pro-democracy efforts. This is a quotation from an anthropologist named John Borneman at Princeton. He says, the public renunciation of the son's claim to inherit the father's power definitively ends the specific Arab model of succession that has been incorporated into state dictatorships among tribal authorities. I never hear this mentioned on any public media. But decisively, this was the first thing that had to open to prepare the way for popular democracy movement. In Egypt's revolution, we Asma Mahfouz was mentioned earlier in the week. Um, here's a great quote from her talking about the fact that young and married women were able to rise to leadership roles. They, we've had FSIers in past years who were women bloggers from Egypt. And they have pointed out to us, remember? Noha. Yes? Noha. Yes? And she said it was much easier for some women to work from their homes. They didn't have to go out and fight in the public square. Remember that? Yeah. In Tahrir Square, approximately 20% of the demonstrators were women. Um, and, and this has been uh, an important highlight of that revolution. You remember this very famous photograph. This was one of the physicians, a volunteer doctor at the field hospital that had been set up in Tahrir Square. And she became targeted by uh, thugs and security and was attacked on December 17th. This picture went all over the world and they never mentioned that she was a physician. This is a website 
called www.egyptianwomen.info that we commended to you. It was set up by a war correspondent named Tatiana Zolchenko. She just finished a master's degree in media and communications at the University of Peace. She set this up. She is infatuated with the role of women in the revolution and the post-revolution and has put up this website with articles and photographs. And she wants people to be able to use it. The only thing she asks is if you're, if you're going to copy a photograph, please write to her and ask her for permission. So in the case uh, of Yemen, we have um, one of the um, societies where um, the, the constraint on women is um, much uh, bigger even than, than in Egypt in terms of traditional society. Women don't really have um, the uh, ability to even uh, uh, call themselves feminist. And I wanted to share with you a, a quote uh, of Tara Paul Karman, who was uh, with Nobel Peace Prize. She was talking at Harvard last year and she said, uh, women here <coughs> cannot come in Yemen and say that we are fighting for our rights as women. We fight for everybody's rights. We fight for men's rights. We fight for others' rights. And she says, eventually, we will be able to, to fight for our own rights. But this, is, this was a very telling um, recognition that uh, she, uh, she was able, actually, to, to be this leader in Yemen um, because she, she actually used the fact that she's a conservative uh, woman and seen as a good Muslim woman. She's married, she has three kids. And she doesn't uh, challenge at all any of the stereotypes of the Yemeni society. But as a journalist and as a human rights defender, she had a, a, an amazing impact uh, on society. So our, our friend from Yemen is not here. I would have uh, liked to share uh, her <laughs> opinion on that. So we're, we're almost at the end, so I want to squeeze in one other thing. There's a wonderful account on Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera, an interview with her husband. And he says, well, she is better at doing these things than I am. So I take care of our three children, and I manage her cell phone so that she can do everything that only she can do. Beautiful. So we want to just pose the question, is there a women's advantage in struggles? Now, we have two social scientists, Margaret Keck and Catherine Sinking, who've done a lot of important work. Uh, they have a book called Activists Beyond Borders, which everyone at FSI should read, just on general principle, should be this book. But they have pointed out that more than any other groups, women's organizations use the term network and networking to describe their interactions. I think this is a very penetrating insight. Sivan, you as a social scientist, yeah. you agree or disagree? I agree completely. Okay. 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 Do you think I just just look at Elizabeth. I have a very specific question to ask. Yeah, yeah we're almost there. Yeah. We're almost, yeah, I think we've got only one more slide. I know slide. I really need to <laughs> Um, two more slides. Um, so one, one of the observed capacities of women as organizers is their ability to work with all ages and all groups. Jenny has mentioned Christian Muslim. They can work with the elderly, with children, uh, with youth. Uh, they're able to move across some of the divisions of some societies with a great deal of facility. And um, we've, I've actually already uh, mentioned that uh, uh, Fred Halliday, who was at the London School of uh, Economics for many, many years, has called the women's transnational movement for the vote probably the most rem remarkable uh, mass mobilization of the modern age, the modern age. Building solidarity ties across lines and uh, divides and conflicts um, we have seen women in the anti-slavery movement early on in the presentation working, black and white women working together at a time where that was not possible. Um, civil rights movement, interracial movement, Israel-Palestine. This book documents how um, Israeli groups and Palestinian groups that began working in approximately 1980 are actually the genesis of the nonviolent direct action that starts the 1987 Intifada, and specifically a relationship between a political journalist, an Israeli former paratrooper conscripted named Gidon Spiro, 
and a Palestinian named Faisal Hussein. So the, the ability to walk, work across an acute conflict, this is something that has been observed as something that women have sometimes got the capacity and skills to do that, that men have been unable to do. In Liberia, Jenny already pointed this out to us, the women of Srebrenica memorializing the losses of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Again, it's Christian women and Muslim women working together to memorialize the tragedy of all of their losses. And then, of course, in the social network era, the networking skills on a broader international scale. Uh, transnational electronic activism, some people think, is the wave of the future. At any, at any rate, 57% of Facebook users are women, and that will vary. It will go up and down in different parts of the world. And here's our last slide before we get to questions and answers. Just want to throw some questions at you for possible research. This field is wide open. If you are thinking about doing a doctorate and you are interested in this field, it is wide open. There are hundreds of issues that beg for research. So one question is, in contemporary struggles, how are women activists contributing to the development of strategy and tactics of civil resistance? We need the documentation. Too, many, too much is undocumented. Secondly, what properties of networking so characteristic of women's organizing may strengthen future civil resistance campaigns? We're seeing new forms of networking develop including something called the boomerang pattern, documented by Keck and Sekin, where if a women's group is too weak inside to influence the situation, they can go outside and mobilize electronically, and it comes back inside from international networks. Third question, just to throw at you, how has the philosophical and strategic connection, because this is more than moral, this is a strategic connection, between the means and the ends, which is historically part of civil resistance. How can this empower and strengthen women resistors? So with that, we'll go to questions and answers. Yes. Uh, I have a question uh, about, um, well, I actually have two questions, but the second one is the easy one. Um, the first one is more of uh, your thoughts. How do you think the evolution of women's roles, for example, in the US context, um, the presence of women in combat zones now. How do you think that the cha those changing of roles can change the concept of, of women in civil resistance presenting stronger dilemmas for security forces um, in civil resistance campaigns? Do you think steps toward gender equality will pose new challenges for women who are in civil resistance movements, such as the changing of, of the roles that we're playing in society? And the second one, I'm sorry, is can we get a copy of your card for a presentation? Yeah, yeah. Yes. 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 Second. I think everybody here has access to the new classroom. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but we don't the, know if you we get, we'll get all get the breakout yeah. 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 So that it just takes a little while. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> I think this is a very, very difficult question, Angela, and I don't know that we have the tools to answer it properly yet. Um, I know, the he actually, the head of the International Fellowship of Reconciliation Program for Women Peacemakers is a woman who went into the U.S. Army. And her position is, you cannot change the U.S. Army. The U.S. Army will change you. Shelley Anderson is her name. I can put you in touch with her to ask her. Um, I think this is a very difficult question. Women have gone into combat uh, Often it's jobs related, and they don't think of themselves as um, people who are liberating or fighting for rights or anything like that. They want a job. Uh, they want access to those great jobs with great retirement and travel and uniform and learning technologies and so on and so forth. I think it's really difficult. As far as the direct contact between a female soldier and a female civil resistor, this is what's in the two minute um, yes, we can link from Boudris. Okay. Shall we use this as an? We're gonna we're gonna do all the questions, but ma maybe since there's an Israeli soldier, the, this question comes up in this, and it's only two minutes. Why don't we try to go with this and see if that at least gives you uh, something to think about? Ilta 
أنا أول إشي إنه تطلع مسيراتي كثيرة ضد الجدار، لكن أنا لاحظت إنه أول إشي كانت معظمها رجال، أنا ما كان في ولا إمرأة في المسيرة، فأنا قلت له يعني إيش معنى الرجال بيروحوا على المسيرات وهيك إنه لازم النساء كمان يروحوا على المسيرات. أنا ما كان في مسيرة هيك على الرجال أبدا كنا كانت مسيرة مشاركة نسوية ورجال והדבר הכי קל שהיה על הצד השני לפלסטינאים זה להביא את הנשים, את הנשים שלהם, לקו עימות הראשון. כדי שלא נתקוף אותם באלימות. to push the soldiers and the revenge, and none of them could do that. But I think the girls could do it. יסמין זה שם ערבי גם, אז הם תמיד קראו לי יסמינה. מבחינתם יסמין זה יסמינה בכפר. אז תמיד הם קוראים לי יסמינה, למה את פה, את לא צריכה להיות פה, היו אומרים לי בואי נחתן אותך עם הבן שלנו, נביא לך פרסים, תעזבי את מג"ב, תבואי אלינו, ממש. זה קודם כל בשפה משותפת, בדיבור, לקחת אותם בידיים, להעביר אותם, ורק אחרי זה, במידה ויש צורך, אה, לפעול עם אמצעים לפיזור ההבנות. גם אם קיבלו מכות, גם אם התפוצצו לידם רימוני הלם, גומי, גם אין להם בעיה עם זה, הם פשוט הלכו עד הסוף כדי שהאדמה שלהם תישאר שלהם. And there were also some pictures, right now we saw it in the film, but also some pictures in the presentation about children being used in demonstrations and uh, I mean, or participating in demonstrations and also having particular roles in demonstrations. And I wonder if you have any, uh, I, I mean, I know Martin Luther King also wrote on the subject. Yeah. Well, I, actually in Birmingham in 1963, um, the, uh, The whole ferment in the city was uh, very, very great because there was someone with the title of Commissioner of Public Safety, whose name was Bull Connor. And Bull Connor, how he ever got the name of Commissioner of Public Safety is beyond me. Because at the time that I went to Birmingham, 
it, we called it bombing camp. There were more than 60 unsolved bombings in the black community, unsolved, he's called Commissioner of Public Safety. But his, his, uh, he, he was famous for interrupting demonstrations before they began. So as the children came out of the church once to, to take part in something, he locked them all up. One of the organizers went throughout the schools saying, Gandhi said to fill the jails. We're going to fill the jails. And before long, there were 600 children in jail. This activated all of the parents. The parents were already involved. And the entire black community in the city was involved. So the children were not going to be left out. I think more often than not, you find it's a case where the children will not be left on the sides. And the parents, in fact, can't contain them. Because in, in that case, the cause was so just. It was just like Nashville. It's that, that the black people could go downtown into department stores and spend their money. Their dollar was acceptable, but they had no place to eat. The water fountains were labeled black or colored and white. Um, there were separate restrooms. And people couldn't try on clothing. The children and the women couldn't try on clothing to see if it fits. So, so the community was already in a state of um, perturbation and concern. Now, I don't think that the children could be uh, kept out of it. And then four young girls were killed in a bombing of a church in that April. And so all of the younger generations were involved. I, I know that there are often allegations made that the children are being exploited, but I myself uh, think that that is not so much. I ask, yeah, there's, a, there's an important addendum, though, to that story that I just heard about this year, that after the horrific fire hosing of the children that upset you know, many people, there was a march the next day, Sam Diener, our peace educator at um, the Center for Nonviolent Solutions in Worcester has written about it. And uh, Bull Connor ordered, you know, more fire hosing. And the fire men were so troubled by what had happened be the day before that they had, you know, been hosing children that they, they refused. It's a fascinating um, next chapter to that. Uh, that famous photo and you know what actually its effect it, it was more than the snapshot that you get. I think organizers have to be very careful about this uh, but, and sometimes a, a community becomes so sweepingly involved that yeah. it's really not I, I, I mean I often don't you know I have to face a dilemma about you know am I going to take my, my son with me to things is it too dangerous uh, is that really the role of him to be there but I, want, I, I know uh, you guys are so intentional with the structure. Uh, do children come to demonstrations? We have had some demonstrations that we call children, especially when we deal with the education issue. And on the sides, we actually have been running for the last two years child rights training workshops where we've built the capacity of children to understand the role of defending human rights. But it's a, it's a big issue. Uh, we, we had run-ins with the American ambassador once before for um, babies coming on their mother's backs yeah. to the demonstrations. Um, but, you know, we faced internal lots of pressure. The mother's just saying, it's for that kid that I'm actually here. So, and I have a right to be here. You can't sideline me. It's my choice to look after my baby. And, and, and it's difficult because sometimes we would then have to lobby the police to say, release the mothers and babies first. It doesn't always work. Human rights lawyers are not always that aggressive at getting internationally uh, recognized uh, understanding of mothers and babies. So children, but it is a very big issue. Yeah. And they really are there. But they first have to understand nonviolent discipline. That's what I was going to ask you is, how do you maintain that? Because the role of, oh, oh. I am the mother and you are my child, is lost when there's a whole bunch of children at once and you are in demonstration mode. You can't suddenly pull parental authority on a kid. Oh, yeah, there, there was training 
yeah. for the children in Birmingham. And also, the, the, there were mass meetings in the churches every night where there's a local struggle. I talked on the first night about the fact that the civil rights movement was a movement of movements, and that there were lots and lots and lots of local movements, each of which had their own priorities. And the children were kept out of any of this. And there was an intermingling but, with the daily. But there was a debate about that. Sorry? The, but there was a debate within the movement regarding this strategy, whether they take the children or not. And on I, a local I, basis, uh, lo locally, yes. And I've read in few places that actually Martin Luther King was, uh, well, he opposed the idea of bringing children to the demonstrations. Yes. So he was, of course, not the only one involved in the civil rights. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, I know. <laughs> and that's, he was the exemplar of the movement. He was not in the sit-ins, for example, which is what made it a movement. He was on television talking. I, I, I agree with you, and this is why when I mentioned today that there are different layers of leadership. Um, yes, it's true, but it is a debate. Brother Kusta. Yeah, I was going to say, I think, I mean, the, the issue of children, if you take the children with the aim of dodging uh, consequences, I think that's wrong. However, if the, mm -hmm. the children, which is the case in, uh, in South Africa from 1976, the struggle, the government hammered very fast this thing in the international community that children were being used. Actually, nobody was using those children. They were running out of themselves. Their parents were totally opposed because they were scared themselves that the children just ran into. That's why you, if you notice all those things there, uh, around about uh, eight, from, from uh, 76, 76 to 1984, there were no huge numbers of others into our streets on any protest. Mm -hmm. It was always ran by children. I mean, when we started to run those things, I would have been maybe when I was uh, taking a responsibility, I would have been uh, sort of like 17 years. And can you imagine at that time there was not a single a person was wrong. So I'm saying that I would agree that uh, the, uh, if you use children for because you are dodging to suffer yourself, that's wrong. But if, for example, in a normal match where you 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 uh, emphasize non-violence intention on your side, there's nothing wrong to come out as your family if you, in your whole house you believe in that, and then you walk with that. And then, in that situation, I do not believe we are using the children because your intention anyway wasn't to provoke violence and you're going down with your children. Your intention was to move on the basis that you were uh, going on a peaceful. And in fact, the historian and social scientist Charles Tilly says that the presence of mothers with children is evidence of worthiness of your campaign, <laughs> your cause. And this helps to communicate to others that we have a dignified, worthy cause. Won't you come join us? But you have to be responsible for the very end of Kate because I've been in custody with children when there's no nappies, there's no food, and of course the mother's not eating, she has no breast milk, and it's a thing, yeah, hardship. Mm -hmm. So we have to, you have to be responsible. I think that the amount of knowledge being, being drummed into the black community across the South by SNCC is a staff of 200 by 1964. Everyone working for SNCC is doing some form of training. And then there are local leaders by the dozens. Women, incidentally, are the backbone of the organizing of the movement at the grassroots local. It's the women who are the great organizers. The men tended to be pushed forward to be the spokespersons because the patriarchal church leadership is so important. But the children are participants in the training programs. They're catching all of this. They're catching it at home. They're catching it from the pulpit because the pastors become involved. They're at the mass meetings. Children don't stay home at the mass meetings. They're right there. They're sitting on the, on the steps. You know, they're sitting in the front of the churches and so on. It's a huge amount of training going to the black communities. Some of it specifically for children. No, but my point, sorry, my point was support once there are consequences. 
to make sure that the children's suffering in the prison, police cell's condition is somehow lessened. Very hard to do. Uh, beyond Very legal representation, you have to then respond. It's a humanitarian, I suppose. Very hard. I just pick up on Jenny's point that it makes the great hardship. And I just want I just want to add that people who have involved young children in their demonstrations along with the mothers. I just want to know if there comes a point um, during the during the movement or demonstration that comes that when the motherhood stands like between you and your cause, mm. what do you do then? If if the, for example, if there is an attack from the opponent. For example, if there is an unsafe condition, then what's next? Do you start gathering your children and run back home and put them to a safe place, or do you still carry on? Oh, I don't think, I think that we need better planning and movements than for that kind of ad hoc decision making. Yeah, because because if you will move on, fine. But this will show to an opponent that you are strengthened enough. But if you run back, they will understand. See that this this didn't work. This trick didn't work. No, I believe I believe in extremely well planned demonstrations where people walk with long spaces between rows because it makes the march look bigger and grander. In which there are people with armbands who show the edges and who are prepared to deal with issues. I, I, I am a proponent of preparation if, and even over preparation mm -hmm. so you don't have this kind of accidental what well, now what do we do mm -hmm. I, this is the, as Peter Ackerman says if you don't plan you lose mm -hmm. I, I think there was a hand over here Jason and then we'll come back to you did you make your point Claire oh I was just gonna say on the children commentary that it depends on the age I mean I have a very vivid memory of my daughter at three pulling me, you know, just begging me not to get arrested because she, so it's quite difficult when they're so small for them to see something happen to you that they can't, you know, do anything with. Um, but it is a complicated, you know, it's a, it's a complicated question. The movements have to figure these things out for themselves. It's a combination of practicality, strategy, and ethics. And they've got to grapple with these and a lot of other questions and they should grapple with them in advance, not on the spur of the moment. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just though, the, the dilemma is that it's a collective consideration, but then the mother is personally torn because you're, it's, it's your own daughter, and so you're thinking, do I placate, you know, help her not to be distressed, or do I go forward? So it's, it's a, many, many pieces to discerning what to do there. Jason. Uh, thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. Um, I've got a question as an educator and as an organizer uh, to the educators and organizers. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you do when uh, concrete examples of sexism come up? Or oh, well, behaviors, you know, that uh, exhibit sexism? Uh, come up either in trainings or in demonstrations. I'm just interested in how people respond to that and how they deal with the tension between uh, advancing, you know, equality amongst men and women and also advancing the causes of the movement. I'm just really interested in those responses. I don't mean to sound flippant, but what you do is you speak out and you say that this is uh, corruption of the connection between the means and the ends. How can you fight for a more perfect, or more equitable society and also in your own ranks be espousing uh, sexism? You, you Would you always out. speak out? Pardon? Would you always speak out in every situation? Or would there be times when you kind of yeah, buy um, your, buy the time? Or? Yeah. There, there's actually a document called Sex and Caste that I wrote, am a fellow yeah worker, Casey Hayden, um, wrote in 1965, it was published in 1966. Alan Straper can tell you all about it. Um, <laughs> and, um, um, that was a byproduct of discussions among women in the movement. There was a lot of discussion about this because we were learning so much about um, the techniques for organizing and uh, we were learning deeply about political thought 
and the connections between ideas and action, we were dealing with a whole basket of very important things. And we began talking about it as applied to women. And uh, this document was published by the War Resisters League in 1966, and is now a number of historians credited with having sparked second wave feminism. So, yes. Um, Alice. Yeah, I mean, it just seems that's a false dichotomy, and that's always presented, I feel like, in movements like, oh, the women's rights issue is detracting from this other bigger issue that we need to address first, when it's not, that's not the dichotomy. It's not like the movement loses if the women's rights are also a part of that movement. So I, I hate the way that's structured so much of the time in, in discussions about movements, and as if women's rights were some competing interest that's taking away from something. Yes, there were those who said that it was a distraction. Well, we yeah, talking. people still say that this yeah, is So I'm just thinking, like, as organizers, yeah. how and educators, you know, what are the ways people intervene in that? Others said it was a deviation. Um, the 1960s were a long time ago. In 2013, this shouldn't be an issue. Mm -hmm. That's the, sorry, that's yes, please. Please. We're happy about Mary. That's still an issue. I mean, yes, and I. I just want to say, that Officially, we're on break now. You're welcome to stay and, and talk, but we're going to come back in this room at 4 o'clock.